Hi, I'm Jeb Marsh, Winsky Communications. Industries as diverse as entertainment, hotel, taxis, automotive, aerospace are being disrupted by new technologies. Hi, I'm Chet Marchwinski, Communications Director at the nonprofit Lean Enterprise Institute, and today I'm talking about our disrupted business world uh, and whether lean product and process development can help us uh, survive and, and thrive on it with uh, Jim Womack. Jim is the founding CEO of the Lean Enterprise Institute, where he is now a senior advisor. He is the author of Gemba Walks and co-author of Machine That Changed the World, uh, Lean Thinking, Lean Solutions. Uh, and seeing the whole value stream. He led the research team at MIT that coined the term lean production in 1987. And ever since, he's been a pioneer in helping uh, managers and executives and companies understand uh, lean production management work and how to create more value with less waste. Jim, thanks for being here, taking time out from the annual Lean Product and Process Development Summit to talk a little bit uh, about disruption. Um, you're a longtime observer of the auto industry, and I was uh, wondering if these new technologies that are disrupting the auto industry, such as the autonomous vehicles, alternative fuels, uh, hyperconnectivity, will encourage companies, car companies, have, as you've tried to encourage them, to be more than car companies, uh, that is, uh, solve people's mobility problems by providing not just an automobile, but essential services like insurance, and when the time is right, just have the next car that I need, or SUV, or pickup truck, uh, show up in my driveway. Uh, do you think they're going to get there, or is that, uh, is that wishful thinking? Well, first, I'm not trying to make the world safe for car companies. <laughs> maybe we don't need car companies. Uh, maybe a car company uh, steps forward to have a direct and continuing touch with mm -hmm. the person who wants mobility. Maybe somebody else steps forward, and that's part of the disruption that we think of the people who are likely to step forward are coming out of kind of the new Silicon Valley world yeah. rather than the old Detroit world, and that's what's so scary about this for the, uh, the big car companies. Uh, their response to it, of course, is to invest in everything. Go out and buy a, uh, an autonomy business, uh, go out and buy a sharing thing, or at least take a big stake in a sharing uh, organization, uh, and to do their own experiments with even alternatives to uh, batteries. So they're trying to mostly protect themselves. That's good. But why don't we start with a customer? All right, so that's good always place, the, yeah, the issue. Uh, why don't we start with the customer and work backwards to figure out what we need in the way of an industrial structure. And it's really early days uh, on that, mm -hmm. that what you see right now is a lot of chaos. And, and by the way, the notion that this is all going to happen quickly, uh, when I first started looking at this 10 years ago, when I looked at autonomy plus shared assets, that's Uber, Lyft, mm -hmm. plus non-carbon sources of energy, because the battery is not the point, the fuel cell is not the point, it's where you got the electrons, where you got the carbon, where oh, you got okay. the hydrogen, you don't want to get carbon with it. Mm -hmm. And then this notion that we're going to be totally connected, totally connected, that gives everybody sort of a slightly creepy feeling. I thought, mm -hmm. whoa, A, this is going to be really hard to do. I think there's a lot of benefit if we can do it, but really hard to do. And there are a lot of issues that go way beyond technology. So now, if you look at what we've got, uh, the launch date for an autonomous product that has nobody in the vehicle except you and me, it just goes back at the rate that the calendar goes <laughs> forward. It was going to be in 1919, uh, 2019, yeah, now 2020, okay. now 2021, maybe 2022. Okay. And then when we're going to have a fully uh, electrified fleet, well, in the States, uh, from a governmental perspective, it's not on the plan. Uh, in Europe, it's off and on. Uh, in China, uh, where they have a sort of dictatorial power yeah. to do these things, well, it seems to be on full blast. But even so, uh, that's hard to figure. And then finally, uh, this business about uh, asset sharing, which was supposed to be to a point where none of us would need a car, we would just take Uber and Lyft. Well, mm -hmm. Uber and Lyft have yet to show any evidence they can make any money. So it's uh, and now it's, it's Uber's going to get into aeros aerospace and f yeah. air taxis that's and right. so on. Yeah, so that's, that's, uh, that's right. Autonomous air taxis. Why don't you go first? Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me how it is. I'll report back. <laughs> okay, if, <laughs> I, okay, if possible. So uh, you mentioned uh, uh, a couple of items that uh, well, in a recent e-letter you noted, um, and I wanted to bring it up about uh, 
there's the auto industry, industry's response to, Toyo, uh, to uh, uh, disruption, and then there's Toyota's response to mm -hmm. disruption, mm -hmm. and it's it's quite you know all the automakers or would be automakers, including um, I think the appliance maker Dyson is getting mm -hmm. they've decided mm -hmm. that, that they're going to go electric vehicles mm -hmm. uh, autonomy, but then you know you noted that uh, Toyota's pursuing electric vehicles and also hydrogen fuel cells, mm -hmm. and then self-driving vehicles, but also human-driven dri vehicles, but with software so the human can't make a serious mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a partnership with Uber, but they're also experimenting with their own fleet mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. uh, shared autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. So is this, uh, you know, Toyota uh, engaging in deep study, or is it just that they don't know what to do, mm -hmm. or is mm -hmm. it, uh, uh, you know, an example of um, early on concurrent engineering, mm -hmm. set-based concurrent engineering? Right. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, the key thing Toyota remembered to bring to the party was a whole lot of money. A whole lot of money, like three times what anybody else has got to play with. And that's company policy going all the way back to the bankruptcy of 1950. They okay. said, we ran out of cash. We will never run out of cash again. Mm. So therefore, they go into this uh, as a rather cautious company. Would like to be a follower, actually, rather than a leader, technologically. Uh, Prius is oh, really? the big, big exception. Uh, they really convinced that the world was going to change and that Prius was going to take so long to develop, they ought to get going. Mm. And so they did. But that really is the exception. That's the one big innovation in the 75-year history of Toyota. Oh. So uh, this is a pretty cautious company. And they say, gosh, you can't predict the future. Don't forget, they don't believe in forecast. No, they believe right. the <laughs> forecast for sales in 1950, and that's why they went bankrupt. They went and built a whole bunch of stuff that nobody wanted because the economy tanked, and they ran out of cash. So they say, whoa, you know, we don't believe in forecast. We don't think anybody can forecast. So therefore, we believe in portfolio of opportunities and alternatives. But also, we say at this point, isn't this really a situation for concurrent engineering? Here's the problem. And uh, we have uh, a lot of people who are getting old, can't drive, a lot of young people can't drive, a lot of people who shouldn't be driving. So there's a problem. And then this carbon thing, they believe the, the climate thing is not a hoax, that it's real. Whether they're right or wrong, don't know, but that's mm -hmm. what they believe. Uh, they believe that there really is a desire uh, not to put money into cars and instead to share somebody else's asset. They think these are all valid, realistic things for people to want, and probably some people, maybe a lot of people, want them. So therefore, they need to try some experiments, okay? But they can't forecast. So what do you do when you need to try experiments, but you can't forecast? And the answer is, well, you try every experiment you can afford, and they can afford a lot of experiments. So that's where they are. Okay. Yeah. And how about the, uh, and you mentioned the, uh, the study phase. That's the first phase of lean mm -hmm. product and process development, mm -hmm. uh, when the team does research and uh, really learns about the intended customer and what their, their needs and mm -hmm. desires are. But you've asked these uh, product, development, uh, product development teams mm -hmm. to rethink how they define customer value during this phase. So what's the, uh, the problem mm -hmm. that you see mm -hmm. or the pitfall that you see some of these teams making? Well, let's see. There are two kinds of problems. Uh, first, and this is interesting to think about, in the world today, no one paying the actual cost has ridden in an autonomous vehicle without a test engineer. Now, there have been a few Tesla drivers who inadvertently uh, <laughs> discovered that yeah. they should have been the test engineer. <laughs> but uh, if you go to the Waymo uh, project, which has been the leader, Waymo is the Google self-driving car program, now an independent subsidiary, they're still holding back on when do we want to take the test engineer out. Um. So how do you know what people feel about a product when no one has ever actually used it. Because the real product is you get in the vehicle, you push the let's go button, the door shuts, it, you've got it on your app, you've told it where to go, mm -hmm. and it starts off uh, with you in the back seat uh, saying, whoa, and whoa, wait a minute, how much is this going to cost? Okay, so that's one and, problem. And you don't have your hands on that's the wheel. Right. So That's right. So, And by the way, you're way away from the wheel, and then eventually they'll take the wheel out. But the point is that you have to do long-term investment, long-term investment on big systems mm -hmm. without any evidence of what people actually think about this, which mm -hmm. is the exact opposite of the minimum viable prototype concept 
that uh, the Lean Startup movie, uh, movement introduced, but mm -hmm. which uh, like most people in the development community uh, believe in. So there's no way to do a cheap, quick test. What you have to do is this great big system test. So that's very risky. Okay? So that's one of the problems here. Uh, and then the other is that uh, these are all, all of these things are technically very daunting. And they involve not just one or two things that haven't been done before, they involve lots of things. Yeah. So you're going to build, wait a minute, you're going to build a new product that's got a whole lot of components. And what we believe in the lean uh, product and process development community is that before you finalize the design, you should make sure that the components want to live together. Okay? So they have to be uh, compatible before you go to final. Right? Compatible for completion, as Jim Morgan would say. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Well, how are we going to do that? <laughs> because you, you can't have some software for an autonomous vehicle that sort of works. Okay. <laughs> that's fine for right. a social media app, and yeah. that's where the lean startup movement started with the MVP idea. They pointed out people were trying to get perfect code before they ever showed it to a customer. Well, here, I don't, my, you know, I don't know about you. But I really don't want the beta yeah. version yeah. of an autonomous <laughs> vehicle. Yeah. I really want the mature, yeah. bug-free version. So that makes a much higher uh, standard of mm -hmm. trying to do this. But and let's just take uh, one more thing. That one of the things that is happening in this disrupted age is that a lot of products that we thought we understood and we thought we knew the customer base it's not just that they want something new and different, it's that they don't want the old thing. And it's quite striking in the car business right now that, uh, if I may give the example of Ford, uh, with help from Jim Morgan, got to be pretty darn good at uh -huh. developing cars. So three, four, five years ago, they set out to develop replacement models for their cars. And over the last five years, it turned out people don't want traditional cars. So the, the risk is that you develop a brilliant traditional car, which nobody wants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, we've taken development time down in the car industry from, say, ballpark five years in the States down to three and a half. But wait a minute, in the world we're in right now, three and a half years is eternity. Mm -hmm. So what's a, what's a developer to do? And the answer is <laughs> be lucky. <laughs> because inherently there's just a lot of uh, risk in this. That's right. The whole market shifted away from yeah. sedans to yeah. SUVs and, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and pickups. And the other thing, do you think, uh, are, are these development teams paying enough attention to, all right, even if we get the the, uh, the software right and the autonomous mm -hmm. vehicles right mm -hmm. here, uh, what do we do when the, when the battery's dead? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no, mm -hmm. they're, they're, are, are they thinking long term enough? Yeah. It's one more uh, feature that uh, one of the Toyota sayings, I don't know where this came from in Toyota, but I've heard it over the years, is that every countermeasure to deal with a problem can be depended on to create a new problem. <laughs> okay? Now, by the way, uh, the same guys who want to bring you autonomy are the guys who brought you handheld electronics that create driver distraction, which gotcha. is why the death rate is up. Okay, but oh, that's really? okay, because we're going to provide autonomy which will take it right back down again. Thank you very much and give me the money. Okay, that's, that's pretty weird. So there, it's, it's sort of predictable that when in these big systems, when you start changing one part of the system, you're gonna get all kinds of knock-on effects. And then uh, there's just new things that have to be done that didn't have to be done before, you know? Yeah. You take your motor oil and you dump it in the barrel and you take it out to the motor oil recycling center or something. Easy. But what do you do with a ton of battery? Okay. Well, yeah. uh, <laughs> landfill? No, <laughs> don't do that. Yeah, right. <laughs> but hang on, uh, that creates a new problem. Uh, there is a time lag because the batteries are good for five, six years. And right now we're still way down the S-curve if there's going to be an S-curve. Mm in terms of uh, adoption of electrics. It's, you know, what, 1% or less of the market in the States. So where it really becomes an issue is, A, when you ramp up the curve and then you oh, stay okay. there for a while, and then suddenly, five, 10 years later, you've got all this stuff. However, wait a minute, there is actually, for the battery, there is a countermeasure. And that is that you want your renewables powering your server farm Suppose you're Amazon with Amazon World Services. By the mm -hmm. way, they are a big carbon dioxide emitter because it takes so much energy to run those server farms. Yeah. So if they're going to switch over to wind and sun, they've got to have battery farms 
to go with the server farms. And where do you get the batteries? You get it out of the used battery electric oh, vehicles. And when, by the way, when you're finished with life of a battery in a vehicle, it's still got 80% of its charging capacity. Oh, really? Yeah, and it's that goes on for a long time. If you don't, you can get a long life mm. out of a battery that's no longer any good for a car, in part because you've got to have that surge power to get out of harm's I way see. and so yeah. forth. But if you can just run it in a steady state, you're not going to stress it too hard, well then you can run these batteries for I don't know how many years, but for a lot. So problem creates a solution, create what, yeah, does problem create a solution, yeah. but the point I say is problem causes a countermeasure to be put in place, which causes a problem which causes a countermeasure to be put in place. Mm -hmm. And is there ever an end to this? Well, probably not, but at mm -hmm. least on balance, things are getting a bit better. I hope we so. Hope. Oh, yeah. we, hope. we hope so. Yeah. Right. So your lean journey began at MIT in 1979 with publication of mm -hmm. Machine that, that Changed the World. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, what's the, what do you see as the current state of the lean management movement, mm -hmm. and what do you see as the future state? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, first off, I started studying uh, the car industry in 1979. Uh, Machine that Changed the World was published in 1990. Oh, okay. So that was uh, a long, long process of getting that done. And there had been a previous car project uh, that we did in the early 80s that produced a book called Future of the Automobile mm -hmm. that never really found an audience. So I've been at this for a long time. Um, here are the big problems that we've encountered. The nature of the way lean ideas came to the US and to Europe was that people thought it's mostly about factories and it's mostly about techniques, about methods. JIT and Judoka and Andon and so forth. That's what they thought. This is really, it's a bunch of methods. Mm -hmm. It's a toolkit. And so people went out to buy a toolkit. And it took a long time for people to realize that, no, wait a minute, these lean enterprises that we would like to create are interlocking systems which has a product and process development module, and which has a supplier management module, and which has a customer support module, and which has, sure enough, a production module, all wrapped up in a general management concept. So we got the tools in manufacturing. That's what we got. Got it down. Mm -hmm. And as people tried to apply them, uh, typically with consultant short-term intervention, what they discovered is nothing sticks that uh, we were doing uh, Kaizen on top of chaos. It turns out that the specific gravity of Kaizen is greater than the specific gravity of chaos, so glub, glub, <laughs> glub, glub, uh, the Kaizen disappears. You for years have been uh, doing surveys. Uh, we started a long time ago yeah. at LEI about how are you doing, and what people would always report in the surveys when you would say, what's your biggest problem? And they would say, regression to old ways, you know, that we can't sustain it. We did it, and yeah. we turned around, and it was gone. So we've all learned, right? That was, hey, way back when. Every now and then they blame the CEO or senior yeah. management. But way the, yeah, back you know. when, I thought maybe we can Kaizen our way to heaven, mm -hmm. okay? You just do enough Kaizen. Uh, and uh, certainly for the consultant's business model, there's a premise. You can Kaizen yeah, your right. way to heaven. You just need more Kaizen <laughs> yeah, weeks. Right. So we're all older, at least I'm older, uh, and wiser. Well, maybe I'm wiser. But we now realize that you need the whole system. Okay, if you really want to do this, and in particular, you need a management system that uh, really is able to identify problems very quickly and countermeasure them so that you sustain performance. And then uh, if you've created what Toyota would call sta uh, basic stability, then you can raise the standard. And that's what Kaizen is about. It's about mm -hmm. raising the standard. Kaizen is often misnamed. When you fell down here, you did the Kaizen to get back here where you'd been. So, you know, we fell off the bar stool, so now we crawl back on the bar stool. That's Kaizen. That's right. Okay, is that right? <laughs> no, the problem, the problem is we were drunk. That was the problem. And uh, chaos is, you know, another form of drunkenness. So, it's taken a long time for people, I think, to uh, both understand intellectually, but also grasp uh, from a kind of who am I, what am I going to do standpoint that this is a big issue, it's a big problem that we're trying to solve, which is that the world's got way too much waste and way too little value, all right? And so we slowly do make progress. Um, 10 years ago, I would go around companies and we did the boardwalk, that's B-O-R-E-D. At every work area, they would have this daily meeting and what they would list was all the things that went wrong yesterday 
And then they would take them and they would total them up and send them to the improvement office and then they would do Pareto analysis oh, okay. and then they would figure out what was the most common problem and then they would schedule an event at some point in the third quarter uh, to do something about it by which the product was already finished production. <laughs> so I used to see that kind of stuff all the time. And there, no wonder people were bored because they knew the, the teammates who are there, you know, ready to do the work, they know it's not going to get fixed. Right. You know, they're just going to try to get through the day. And everybody's got their own methods for getting through the day. Now, uh, in a lot of places, you go around, you look uh, at the daily management board, and they've got a standard. Uh, are we on or off? Is it green or red? They know. And Toyota's done this for 50 years. Hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then what's our Kaizen plan uh, to what's our need? Okay, which should come out of Hoshin, of what do we need to do to improve? And they've got a plan. And that's different from where we were 10, 15, 20 years ago. That lean was a one and done. Uh, you get some help, internal or external. You go do a lot of Kaizen. You get rid of all the waste. The waste stays away. It, you know, it for goes a while, off. for a week. It goes off grumbling <laughs> somewhere else. Yeah. And uh, life is good. Indeed, uh, you did Kaizen your way to heaven. Turns out, down here on Earth, uh, that's not the way it worked, but we're still, I think, uh, trying experiments and making progress, just not as fast as we like. So it sounds like things are getting a little bit better, and maybe um, mm -hmm. maybe people even go back to machine and read, what is it, Chapter 5 about product development that everyone seems to have skipped in yeah. the, the yeah. first time around, or yeah. went right to production. Yeah, that's right. No, the, uh, that book has five uh, substantive chapters, uh, one on each of the five elements. And yet, uh, in airports, where I've gotten an awful lot of feedback over the years, and in lectures, um, people come up to me to sign the book. I've signed, you know, a lot of copies of Machine that Changed the World. And say, well, what did you get out of this book? I say, well, you know, this is the Toyota production system. You know, it's how they run factories. Uh, say, well, <laughs> A, you didn't read it. If you did read it, you didn't remember it. <laughs> Same difference. Uh, try again. Um, so, for a long time, I just got used to that. I said, hey, that's just the way it is. Uh, now, I think we're making some progress, but uh, never as fast as it should be or we want it to be. Okay. Well, Jim, thanks a lot for coming in and talking about disruption and lean product and process development and scaring us all about getting into uh, autonomous <laughs> vehicles for the foreseeable yeah. future. Okay. So, thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye and now. thank you for watching. Uh, to learn more about lean product and process development, go to leanpd.org. That's leanpd.org. And check out the, uh, the resources that are on the site and pick up a copy of Jim Morgan's book, Designing the Future. It'll show you how... Uh, uh, other companies are, are leveraging product development for enterprise change. And don't forget, you can read Jim's columns and e-letters at lean.org, go to the Knowledge Center, and at uh, planetlean.com.